Well, I'd like to welcome to the channel today, Dave Greta, author of Night Trading. Uh, Dave, thank you very much for joining us today. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to start off here with probably the million dollar question that that everybody you know likes to ask is, can individual investors make money from stock trading? Yeah, I'm going to uh, say possibly, and it requires a lot of work. Uh, if you want to take the lazy way out, which might even be the smartest way, just invest in an S&P 500 uh, index fund, uh, you know, which has done pretty well over time. So, yeah, you need you just need to, you know, it depends how much work you want to put in, uh, but it might be less work than you think. Um, some people tell you you have to, like, you know, pay money for classes and this and that. And there's no secret formula. It doesn't. The more money you spend on educating yourself doesn't necessarily translate into you're going to make a lot of money in the market. You could spend thousands on books, courses, et cetera, and you could still screw it up. So, right. Uh, so, yeah, it's a kind of a loaded question, um, you know, but right now I'm um, doing getting 5.5 percent like I am in the bank on risk free on, on CDs is, is not a bad option either. <laughs> there's a, there's a, a simple way someone can make money without any risks. So. Sure. Yeah. After after many years of the ultra low rates, it's uh, kind of exciting to get you know four or five percent or more off some of these uh, more. Cash is not investments. cash is not trash anymore. Yeah. <laughs> as they said. So so you know referring back to your book, tell us a little bit about what night trading means. What 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 is that? Yeah. So to kind of introduce the book and my and myself and my background, I I consider myself more in the financial education and not losing a lot of your money business is what I describe to people. So uh, the book is really kind of like a, um, a play on words uh, on the word day trading. It's it's really just focusing how you live your life and how you invest and living your life, like mostly focusing, most people would be better off just focusing on their day job, whether you're a dentist, a lawyer, uh, you know, I work in systems, te systems administration and technology. Concentrate on that because that's the one that you can control in your life. And that's, you know, you can get and grow your income with that and, you know, and feed your family. Uh, the stock market is something that, you know, people would say it's gambling. Uh, and I do it at night. So I do a lot of my, the reason I wrote the title is night trading is because I do a lot of my, um, really all of my stock research at night. So, you know, I'll look through CNBC or go through Yahoo Finance or, or everywhere, you know, FinTwit, and I'll get some information on there. But I do it at night. So I worry about my day job during the day. And, and this has worked out like, a, you know, most people say it's a really good way to live your life. If I came to you and said, do you want, would you want to be during the daytime a professional blackjack player or a professional poker player? Yeah, there are some people that do it and microscopic percentage. And they all probably you know, got depressed and stressed and lost their money eventually. So uh, just the same reason people don't want to be a professional blackjack player or poker player during the day. It's the same thing with uh, stock investing. Do you really want to do it all day? I, I know people that do it. Very few. I have friends that make a million dollars a year trading, but it's microscopic percentage of the entire population. So uh, that's my that's my book and my kind of like the way my thesis. Um, I started the first five years of my career out on uh, on Wall Street. So I worked uh, Lower Manhattan at 17 Battery Place and Commodities. And if you know Manhattan, this, that building is, a, is a, the last building on the southern tip of Manhattan, which overlooks the Statue of Liberty. So I worked there. And then I also worked at One Liberty Plaza, which is a giant big black building, which is right across the street from Wall Street and also the Trade Center. So I worked there and I used to, sit, I used to stare at my office at, at Wall Street, literally from you know, being 20, 30 stories up in the building right next to Wall Street. So I had a pretty good uh, view of Wall Street. And I also got my master's in finance right a few blocks on Wall Street at Pace University, which, which my employer paid for. So nice. I have vast experience in that little area of Wall Street. Matter of fact, I've even been uh, underground of Wall Street. So I actually been underneath um, the tunnels. There's tunnels, if you Google it, under Wall Street. I've actually been there. So and not not the subway tunnels, but actual tunnels that are under the Yeah, tunnel. literally there are if you Google it. So I've actually been down there so several years, many years ago, but uh I think they're still there. So uh maybe if you come to New York one time, we can do a you know, you can go down there and check it out. The <laughs> <furthest> police <laughs> down there or something. <laughs> yeah. So 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 being down uh in the Wall Street area sounds like it's had some influence on you. Yeah, definitely. I just went back. Yeah, so my life went full circle. So what I did was I worked down there and then I then I left to go back and consulting and I've worked in other parts of Manhattan. So my life went full circle when 
in 2021 when I wrote my book, I had my book signing on Wall Street. My, my son and I, my teenage son, we took a lim limousine in and I had, that's when I had my book debut, right on Wall Street. So I ended up going back to where I started. And then I even, to top, cherry on top of that story is this summer, a few months ago, I went to, I was invited to the New York Stock Exchange, as, as people can tell from my my pinned tweet and some pictures I, I posted. Um, I met Jim Cramer a few months ago, um, handed him my book. And also I handed him a Celsius energy drink too, which I which I photographed him with. So he actually drank it while I was there. <laughs> so yeah, I met Jim Cramer. So I, my life, you know, everything goes full circle, you know, in a lot of people's lives. And luckily, uh, you know, and I still live, I live like very close to Wall Street, even right now. So I can't see it from my window, but I'm pretty close. That's okay. good. So, so tell me a little bit about your approach to stock trading, stock investing. What, what are the, what are some of the things you look for in companies, and you yeah. know, what, what, how, what's your approach to trading? Good question. I think you have to before you dive into that, you have to kind of like take an approach of, let's just approach it from thirty thousand feet up in an airplane, looking at it. So you have to. I, I would describe my book and myself and my way of investing is kind of like sitting back and how you look and think about the stock market. A lot of people write, wrote these stock, you know, there's thousands of stock investing books out there. No one's really like just taking a step back for a second. And, you know, I do get into detail in my book, but you got to take a step back first and just take a deep breath and look at how you're going to look at and think about the stock market. So the way I approach it is a couple of things. One is I'm an 80% fundamental investor. So I use fundamental analysis. I analyze, you know, a few uh, ratios, uh, balance sheet, income statement, et cetera, et cetera, of the company. The other part of my investing approach is 15% te technical analysis. So the charts, uh, I think, are very important uh, at, at times. And the other 5% is macro and mental. So the macro and mental part uh, is 5%. So I very rarely look at you know, the macro, I don't listen to many, anybody on CNBC and all these economists. And then the mental part. So let's talk about that for a sec. So everybody on, you know, FinTwit and everywhere else, they say, you know, investing is mostly mental. Well, I say it's some mental, but I think it's, to me, it's mostly being in the right stocks instead of mostly mental. So, you know, I mean, if, that's, if investing, and I think, don't get me wrong, investing is uh, to a degree some mental. But if it was mostly mental, we'd have uh, Dr. Phil, Dr. Ruth would be, you know, billionaire stock investors. They, you know, so if it was mostly mental. So there's also would it, be, I, would it be fair to say that the the mental part is really just about the the, the patients and not getting the yeah. money you're investing? Yeah, I write about that in my book a little. You know, I, I tie into my book. So I do talk about the mental part. Um, and I, I tie it in with my lifetime and being associated with sports, not only playing myself, I've got couple sons that are like, you know, could be professional basketball and football players. They're, they're really high level now. So I tie the sports part of it into investing and, you know, the mental part. Um, I mean, I have a book behind in my other room on my bookshelf. I have several investing books. There's one called the Psych I think there's a book called the, the Psychology of Money, which, you know, it's sold millions. It's one of the best everybody talks about it. And it's a great, it's a good book. It's, it's okay. I mean, don't get me wrong, but Psychology of Money isn't going to, the book isn't going to teach me you know, this is just my opinion. It's not going to teach me what stock to buy and what price to buy the stock at. So, you know, it's only going to go so far. Um, but like I said, um, it sold millions of copies, which is great. I hope my book can sell as many as that one. But so I um, so that those are kind of how I uh, approach it. And then to sign of sum this up, um, I look for stocks with low downside risk. Uh, I'm going to say that again because it's so important. I learned this from a, a friend of mine that, that that's a millionaire. Um, is stocks at low downside risk. Well, let's give you an, let's give an example. Uh, PayPal. Now, everybody, including myself, hates on PayPal stock. You know, recently. <laughs> so, but I, I would say that's a stock with low downside risk because let's think about it. PayPal is good or bad, as bad as people might think it is. It's at if you look at a stock chart, it's at generational lows. And the company makes money, and it's a generational low valuations. Now, do I own Paystock, or would I recommend buying it personally? No, but it's a stock that's highly likely not going to go down that much. Uh, so that's, well, that's and if you, if you look at PayPal, you know that that's a company that's a very well established 
payment processing company that a lot of the transactions, a lot of the websites, if you want to do, you know, purchase something or, or make a reservation for a hotel or, or, you know, a lot of different things, PayPal is one of the options generally, if not the only option in some cases for doing that transaction. Yeah, absolutely. So that's an example of a stock with low downside risk. Because like I said, the chances of PayPal going down, and I mean, it, it going down from recently at 50. I mean, if you were buying PayPal $50, um, you know, I, I was I was talking badly about PayPal and some tweets early this summer when it was like 70. I was telling people don't buy it at 70. I was right. Now, if you buy PayPal at 50, you're not looking that you're not looking that stupid because it's let's just be realistic. It's probably not going to go below 50, maybe ever. So, you know, if anything, it'll get bought out someday. So so that's low downside risk. Another stock that I do own is low downside risk. I think you and I were talking about this offline is Devon, Devon Energy, DVN. I just recently got into this stock. And why did I? Because I used my own logic that I just told you about, low downside risk. If you look at, again, zoom in, look, go, go home and look at it, you know, your, your viewers watching this, go, go look at a stock chart of Devon Energy. Um, it's at generational, you know, lows again. And the stock, here's the other thing, they make tons of money. I mean, they make a lot of cash. Yeah, their business has been hit a little bit with oil, you know, going down a little bit, but that's, a, and, I'm, and I'm getting paid a dividend. So the thing is with PayPal, you're not even, for the, holding that stock, you're not even getting a dividend. I mean, at least you had your money in cash instead of PayPal, you're getting 5.5%. Mm -hmm. Devon Energy, though, I'm getting, I'm buying the stock at, at generational lows and, and low valuation. I mean, PE ratio below 10, you know, I mean, single digits. And, and I think you may have mentioned to me before that their cost of production is is fairly low, giving them a lot of more, a lot more flexibility in the market with fluctuation in oil well, prices. Yeah, they can break even at less, like less than $40 a barrel of oil. I mean, so they can still break even. So... <laughs> This to me is a no-brainer. Plus, I didn't even factor in they could. They, there's, you know, documented proof out there. They're looking. They might be getting acquired in the near future. You know, that's just that's public information. You can go Google it. And, and look at the more look like the Middle East situation. You think that could put a squeeze on oil prices? So, yeah. all these factors is why I went into. Uh, I took a position into Devon Energy as almost like a, a no-brainer trade because, uh, and we're and we're still going to need oil. I mean. <laughs> You know, who's going to power up all the? I own Tesla stock and I have a Tesla, but who's going to power the electricity that powers that you plug your Tesla in? So, right. You know. Good. You know, another company I've seen you uh, talk a lot about is Celsius. Can you tell us a little bit about that and your views on that company? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I do tweet about it a lot. Uh, I own the stock. I've been one of the early ish investors in Celsius. Uh, I didn't know anything about I never drank energy drinks my whole life or or even coffee for that matter, or caffeine. So uh, make a long story short, I was in a I was at an investor conference from uh, several hundred people from FinSuite were on two or three years ago in Florida at the Ritz Carlton. So near you, I guess. So yeah, you near uh are you, are you near Disney World or? Uh, I'm in Tampa, so not too far. Uh, you're pretty close. Who didn't know you three years ago? You, you you might not be sitting here. You might already be retired because of people at Celsius stock back then. So make a long story short, I was at the Ritz Carlton at this conference with you know, a lot of heavy hitters from Finchwood here and, and stuff. And then and the guy organizing organizing the conference, he he had this he had some relationship with Celsius. He was drinking this stuff. You know, he was a he works out in the gym and stuff. He was drinking this stuff years ago, and he, he coordinated with Celsius, a the company. They pulled up in a giant truck. Celsius, they unloaded like coolers and, and hundreds, like a hundred cases of Celsius. And I'm like, what's this stuff Celsius? I never heard of it. So I, I started, that's where I started drinking it. And I and I came to the realization, this tastes really good. And, you know, go figure something that with caffeine in it is going to be a hit with people, you know, as repeat business, you know, who would have thought about that? So, so anyway, uh, I started investing in it soon after I went home from the conference and started drinking it. I was like, I got addicted to this stuff. And it tasted so good. I mean, that's, you know, that's the other thing. So I started investing in, in, in when it was around forty dollars, around that range, and, and, and of course I didn't. I sold a lot of it at fifty, et cetera. So I was in out, in out. Then I finally went in about sixty five dollars, my last big purchase uh, last year, and I just held it. Now the stock's you know tripled since then, and now they're also split. So I'm gonna you know that they're splitting on Monday. So um, so that's my Celsius investment, and that's my thesis. Oh, by the way, in the whole along the whole trip in the last two or three years with my Celsius investment, I never looked at one. I never looked at I never looked at Celsius stock chart, nor did I even look at their financials. I mean, so that shows you that people that say you have to, you know, again, I I, I use technicals and I use fun, I use analysis, but sometimes you have to just throw everything out the window and just if sometimes if you do nothing, you know. So Celsius, I didn't know analysis, so it's kind of funny actually. <laughs>
Wow. So at the price point that the stock is at now, is this something that you would recommend people buying into or maybe wait and see if yeah, it comes I don't want to get stock advice, but I would say you might have missed the boat on it. I mean, yeah, it's going to go up, but you're not going to get, I mean, the stock's done a 40 X in the last five years. I mean, think about that. I mean, I, I don't know how much gas it has left, but yeah. Oh, yeah, I think it's definitely going up as they erode mar mar market share away from monster energy drink. But I mean, you might get a one X or two X in the next couple of years, but you're going to get a 40, another 40 X on top of this. I doubt it, but, but I'm still going to hold it. I mean, I have people on here. We have, we have like a whole group of, I mean, I might, some people said they'll die before they sell it. So I might never sell it. I mean, but at some point I might need that tap into that money. So and I'm also going to get a large tax uh, uh, bill for it and when I sell it. So I might not be in such a rush to sell it. So. <laughs> so I think another company that I've seen you talk a lot about and another company and, and a company that gets a lot of people excited, either positively or negatively, is Tesla. Can you tell me a little bit about your views on that company? Yeah, really quickly to sum up, uh, common sense tells me I own a Tesla and, you know, you have a different viewpoint of Tesla if you own one, so which I found. Uh, but common sense just do you really want uh, gas, gas, you know, gas exhaust pipes spewing out into the atmosphere for, you know, next 50, 100 years. So that's the common sense part. The other thing about Tesla is I will say, I'll give you a, a real quote. I, I can't take credit for this quote, but so I got it from somewhere, um, someone on Twitter that's, you know, the big Tesla investor. And they just said simply this. They said, people don't, people don't want EVs. They want Teslas. So think about that. People don't want EVs. They want Teslas. You have to wrap your head around this like, psychological part of it. It's kind of like I've described as like Apple iPhones. You, mm -hmm. you follow. So it's not, it's almost past the EV stage. And like, it's like people already know that in the back of their minds. Okay, it's great. It's, you know, saves, uh, you don't have to pay for gas. But then the part about just wanting it, you know, it's like an iPhone. And what's Apple stock done, you know, in the last 10 years? It's done pretty well. So people don't necessarily even think, they think about it just a part, it's like a lifestyle and a piece of their life. And it's like a, like a, it's almost like an iPhone, but you can drive, I guess. So, those are my thoughts on it. Um, I would only to sum up, like I personally have tweeted this before. I, I own Tesla, like my average cost, per, you know, it all gets back to, you, you can look like a genius in stock investing if, if your average cost is lower than what the stock's trading at. This is just common sense. So I would tell people to only own Tesla at an average cost under $200. So if you do that, you're looking pretty good. Um, I've also seen price ranges on CNBC yesterday. I, just to amuse myself last night, I watched CNBC, which I don't like normally like doing, but they were talking about Tesla and I, and the five people they had at the table at CNBC, the stock price predictors they have anywhere from $50 to 300. So I almost laughed. Wow. I was crying when I was watching. It was just so funny. So, <laughs> so I don't know. It, it's a retail like stock, but eventually um, it, the, institutional investors will come into Tesla. That's what's going to make the stock go up. But at this point, I would say it's a bit risky. I don't, I own Tesla. It's like the fifth or sixth holding in my whole portfolio. I wouldn't advise people, like this is just me personally, my opinion. I'm not sure if I would make it the number one holding in my portfolio, just because it does still have some risk. It's not risk free. Uh, you know, maybe as the stock goes up, it could scale into your number one position, but I don't have it as my number one. It's maybe my number right. six position. I think I think that's very well said. It's it sounds like a company that you're excited about. You have a Tesla. It sounds like you you like the car that you have. What, which model do you have? Uh, model three. I'm model model three. three. And I'm over six feet tall. I'm tall. I can still fit. Yeah, it's it's yeah. It's, a, it's a great car. Well, I think that's great great advice. It's it's a company that you like. You're excited about. You like the product, but maybe at the price point or or where the stock is, not necessarily a great opportunity to buy in at this point. Yeah. And I would I would give you an analogy here. I'm going to tie this into other invest. Just the logic of it that I use the mental approach to investing. This is where a little mental part. You don't always have to go. You don't always need a big investment to make a lot of money in something. If you think something's going to be great, and I'm going to give you three examples. Uh, Tesla stock. You know, if you invested a small amount in it, you know you don't need to invest your whole life savings in a Tesla. You, you would still have done well the last five years if you just scaled into it. Secondly, let's say Bitcoin. If you you know, it's another investment using my my, my description here. Uh, my advice is a small, a very small investment in Bitcoin many years ago would make you um, many, you'd be a millionaire. You follow me? Mm -hmm. And even Celsius Energy, let's let's give you a third example. You know, I didn't invest a lot of money personally into Celsius, you know, relatively speaking. Maybe for some people might be considered a lot, but um, if you were just invested in Celsius when it was, you know, five or 10, 20, $30 a share or even 40, 
a small investment would have you would have done like a multiple x on 10x 20x so yeah. you see my point here you don't need to go all in to even make a lot of money on it what you think could be a great investment so well said very good so you know we we talked about devon energy and this is a company you and i had spoken about recently where you were considering considering potentially doing some some options on it can you tell me a little bit about that and your your thoughts on options yeah definitely and you might not you might not like some of my thoughts on it but let's uh you and i we uh just to, uh we you and i had an offline discussion we, we worked through the math of what i'm about to go over with you so let's let's sit back for a second dude. i'm going to go walk through very quickly a, a call options example and that uh, you and i worked through the math on this so, so here we go i already own devon energy i recently bought it at the low um and then i'm gonna say i'm sitting back this is what it, you know this is myself talking because i said to myself you know what I have some conviction in this stock. I want to. I want to get a little cherry on top. I want it not only to my common shares. I want to invest in call options for Devon Energy. Mm -hmm. So Chris and I here, we offline before this, uh, we worked. I he and I worked through the math together. So I'll give you an example. Say I, I'm very I have a high conviction in Devon Energy that oil is going to go up. You know, so let's let's look out in the future, six months, eight months from now. So next June, we looked at the calls, and I want to take a you know the call. Let's let's be realistic. Call options or you want to make a, a small bet to hopefully make a lot of money. That's the whole beauty of call options or what attracts people. You can invest a little bit of money to make a lot. And then if you lose, you're not going to lose that much. So, okay. uh, so the June 2024 call options, the nature of call options of going out in the future is that far out uh, is the main reason is the negative of it is the call options themselves, whether you're in the money or out of the money or you know, obviously way more expensive than, you know, weekly call option for Devon Energy. Right. So, so we did the math, Chris and I worked this out ourselves and I, he was showing me and I was showing him that those call options. So if you want to go out to $55, the stock's maybe at 45 now. Yeah, I think by next June, it'll be 55. But so those call options will pay you probably, even though they cost way more than, than a weekly call option on, on Devon, they'll, they'll, they're still not that much. Mm -hmm. uh, relatively speaking, but they are, you know, they're not also cheap either. But and but if that stock goes to 55, goes up $10 by next June, you'll make those options will print like probably 10x of you know whatever you put into it. So mm -hmm. for each contract. So that's that's one thing. But then the downside of that is as you were explaining to me, that's you know, you could also a high chance it might not get to 55 and you'll lose your money. Now the flip side, let's let's talk about so that's out of the money call option for Devin next June. And that's that's talk about in the money that you described to me as well. That would be a smarter option. So in the money call option next June, same time frame, eight months from now, is those options are a little bit more uh, expensive, but they and they pay out, but they're less risky because if you buy like a $42 in the money option, the stock's trading at 45 now, there's a good chance that it's going to happen. Um, but Again, you have to, you know, what's your risk, how much money you have to outlay for that to happen. So you, you're probably, you're not going to make as much money on the, in the money as if you hit, you know, a way out of the money call option, which is uh, a little gamble on Devon, it's going to pay 10x. You're not going to make 10x if, you know, you're in the money a dollar on the stock. So, um, so that the summation of what I just told you and what I concluded about this uh, call option math and the math, the math of this, M-A-T-H math of, of all this is I don't really like. This is why I don't really do many options because of what I just described to you, because it's, you know, somewhat risky. Um, there's a lower chance of you know success and it's all about risk reward. I mean, your payout, you know, all, as I just described, might not be as much as what you think if you take less risk. Right. Now to sum up this, I personally, this is my opinion. And I have friends that are the friends I know that make, you know, 500,000 to a million dollars a year options trading. They uh, almost always do short-term options like they're trading like weekly call options i mean this is what my friends do they make a lot of money now the the benefit of that is number one they uh the, the main benefit the, the options are cheaper i mean so you're it's you know they're way cheaper than out of the uh you know future call options like months eight 12 months down the road so um i personally and i might eventually become i might switch from a night trader to a day trader you know when i retire down the road way down the road i might do that but i would only i personally and from my experience i would only do weekly or at most monthly call options so and i think uh, do, you, do you agree with that or well, 
And, 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 and I think you and I talked a little bit about this before as well. You know, just like with stock trading, you've got many different approaches to stock trading, many different flavors of stock trading. Same thing with options. I think the important thing, same with stock trading, is that whatever approach that you're going to use, that you, you make sure you know what you're doing, you make sure that you've, you've done your research and you're not just throwing money, you know, hoping that it pays off. So, you know, I, I think what you've laid out is a very good, thoughtful approach to options trading. Um, personally, I do more short-term options, you know, daily with the SPX and then um, shorter horizon calendar spreads with some of the more blue chip companies like JPM, yeah. and Universal and, and, and so forth. So that's what I like to do, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's it's the best way or better than, you know, other approaches that people are using for options trading. You know, getting back to stock trading, you know, what kind of horizon do you normally look at when you when you're looking at buying into stock? Is this something that you're looking for a return in, in a month or two months, or do you buy with the expectation that it's going to be more like a six or twelve month horizon? Yeah, so what I do, uh, Chris, is the way I had to have my portfolio just high level aligned. I have about thirty percent of all my money in in. Uh, CDs, 12 month CDs getting 5.5%. The rest of it I have invested in the stock market. Um, mostly half of that's probably in like my for my job, like S uh, Roth IRA goes into SP 500 index. And then the rest of that I, I manage my own portfolio, which I post and, and talk about on, you know, I, I post it on Twitter twice a year. Mm -hmm. And a subset of that portfolio that I manage is what I do swing trading. And that's what gets me excited and what's what pays for a lot of I, I swing trade to pay for I mean well, I'm gonna be honest with you to pay for my vacations. So so if you see me posting now, I'm more interested in people, I could care less people's net worth on FinTwit. I posted, I could care less with stocks you or anybody else has in a portfolio, but I do I am interested in vacation pictures. So <laughs> I like to pay, I like to travel. So I'd like to I like to fly first class. I don't want to fly coach. So for me to pay for these vac vacations that could be quite expensive. Um I need money. That's where what, I need what, swing trading. What, what does swing trading mean? What yeah, is swing trading is a, is a time period. So getting back to your question here, uh, you're, and by the way, I'm talking about vacations, if, I, if, I, if I'm not, it motivates me to do well on these trades because if I don't do well, I won't be going on vacation. <laughs> I mean, literally, I'm not being, I'm not being, you know, so no vacations next year if I can't make any money. So exactly. that's what I use to fund my vacations. But yeah, swing trading is anywhere from, like for me and most people means anywhere from two weeks to two years. So I'm in stocks, in, that I use for swing trading. And I've done really well with this. This decade is two weeks to two years. So you know, I mean, I, that's that's my time horizon. So I'm kind of patient, and I'm you know, so if a stock goes up a lot, I might sell it in three weeks. But more than likely, I'm into stock for up to up to two years. So um, that's my time horizon, and that's that's how I do swing trading. Um, the other thing I would add too is uh, I want to just I forgot to mention this. The way I look at investing is even, and even if you're doing call options trading or any kind of trading, I, one key thing I've learned and I've taught myself, I only focus on a few stocks. So for me, I'm going to give you the number 30 stocks. That is only the total of, um, I own about maybe 18 stocks in my portfolio. So I'm only looking at my watch list is like maybe 12 at any one time, and even that's high. So the entire stock market, think about this, of 10,000 stocks or how many there are, I only am only even looking or investing in 30. So take 30 divided by 10,000. It's a microscopic number. So yeah. I don't want to waste my time on like, I don't invest in so the way I look at uh, stocks with high liquidity. So I don't do small caps. I don't do uh, stocks that don't trade a lot of daily volume. You know, I mean, Tesla, I love Tesla. Look at te Tesla trades like 115 million shares are trading hands daily. And the reason I do this is for many reasons. I mean, that's the most popular stocks. It, the, the, the average daily trading volume and the liquidity of the stock is important. I'll tell you why. Because when people are in XYZ stock and a lot of the institutions which own the stocks or even retail investors, they panic sell and they sell and dump their shares. Well, guess what? When a stock you own and the institutions are dumping it, who do you think is going to buy it if there's not enough liquidity? So. You know, they're dumping, people are dumping Tesla stock. I'll use that as an example, which happens a lot. People just panic sell and stuff. Uh, people like me or, or institutions are there. You want a lot of people there to buy it when everybody's dumping it. So if you don't have a high liquidity in stock, you know, it'll just go down and stay down. It might never go back up because there's nobody there to buy it. So that's why 
I look at stocks like uh, high daily, like just highly liquid stocks. So you know a lot of stocks I own in my portfolio, Celsius and Tesla and Uber. Let's take an Uber as an example. I mean, these are stocks that are very popular and that trade a lot of shares daily. And, you know, so... Good. And and for a new investor, if, if they wanted to sort of follow in the same path, how, how would they determine whether a stock has sufficient liquidity, sufficient volume to, to be worth considering? Where, where would you recommend they look? Uh, you can just look at, I mean, I could teach a teenager, look, you go to Yahoo Finance, it tells you average daily volume, uh, you know, of the stock. Now that by that you can't, I also don't invest in penny. I mean, if you invest in EVgo, that might trade millions of shares a day, but it's like, that's a penny stock, you follow me? So I look for stocks like big name stocks like Uber, Tesla. I mean, I know people, I have friends that, most of my friends that are, you know, I, fortunately I know a lot of multimillionaires that in stock investing and even, you know, so um, they're trading in stock. I, a lot of, most of everyone I know that's millionaires and call and options trading and just stock investing and mostly options trading, they only trade a few, stocks like literally a friend of mine he, he's big big on finswood he's 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 a millionaire but he only trades in tesla i have somebody else that just trades amazon you want to be in stocks like like the professional traders they're only focusing on you know you, you drive yourself bananas if you sit if you're if you invest if you, you like do options trading in like 10 stocks or something or even you know even long-term investing so yeah. yeah so just very focused on just a few stocks you don't want to, you don't want to get into analysis paralysis look trying to look at you know hundreds of or thousands of different stocks right you want to be able to focus on stocks understand what's going on with the company and yeah. and the stock that so you don't get caught up in things right well, it's like peter lynch said um he's one of the best investors ever it's like having children each stock is like a child i mean do you want to have 20 30 kids i mean i, I actually met someone at a conference uh, a couple of years ago he was young he, and he worked in the stock industry and this was in uh where was i in um i forget where i was in it might have been florida i think it was in florida at the conference but this is about three years ago he owned 98 stocks in his portfolio so he was about 27 years old 98 the most i ever met i, I, I talked to people like some people 50 it's the most but he had 98 so i was like and you know it's funny well not funny but he disappeared so i don't know what happened to him like he was on twitter and then I, I'm sure he probably lost all his money when this is before the tech crash, you know, everything crashed last year. So if you're going into a, like a, a correction like we had last year with 90, but he told me he was fine. He said, I know what I'm doing. He seems smart. I mean, I told him to read my book, but I don't know if he read it or maybe wished he read it, but I've never heard, we haven't heard, nobody's seen him since. So he might have uh, 98 stocks going into last year's, you know, kind of in the stock market, uh, bear market. Um, he probably got wiped out. So. Wow. You know, speaking of your book, burning question, I have to ask, has Taylor Swift read your book? Uh, no. And I tweeted she doesn't need to because anybody, if you're worth more than $10 million, you don't need to really worry about stuff. You just need to stay rich. So yeah. go buy CDs. And then she hasn't. Um, may I, long, may, uh, I did, uh, I think I was telling you, I did uh, grow up in the same town. I'm from Pennsylvania. So she was born in Pennsylvania. So we both lived in the same town for about four years. I mean, albeit she was one to four years old and I was, you know, a teenager. So, but I never really met her when I was a kid. But we, yeah, so it's a fun, fun story. Yeah, we grew up in the same town. And then she moved to Nashville at age 14, you know, to pursue her career. And what's really funny is one of my followers on, on Twitter here, he went to high school with her in Nashville. So maybe we should have like wow. a reunion of the three of us. And, you know, because, but uh, yeah, she doesn't need to invest in stocks. I don't think. I mean, take 5%. You get a CD, 5% of a billion is a lot of money every year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you know, you mentioned having CDs at 5% interest rates. I'm still trying to absorb that. You know, just so, so much different than just a couple of years ago when we were talking a half percent, you know, for, for many CDs. That's great. So, so Dave, any, any parting words or any parting advice that you would like to give new investors who are looking at getting into stock trading? Yeah, I'm going to say something that's very simple. I would give this advice you want and there's there's some deeper meaning to this but it's so it sounds kindergartenish but i'm about to tell you but you want to be in the stocks that are going up i'll say it again you want to be in the stocks that are going up i know it sounds really you know you might think it's like kindergarten or something but uh so that for the obvious what that means you can you can figure that in your head but the other there is a deeper meaning to that and i would tell you to read the book uh think and trade like a champion by mark Minervini, who's kind of one of my i'm a I'm kind of a disciple of his 
uh, investing style. He's also made eighty million dollars in the stock market, so I, I tend yeah. to believe. Him. So yeah, there is a, so being in the stocks that are going up. There's a simple meaning to that, but then there is a deeper meaning. You have to read the book as far as the, the stocks that are going up and, and where he buys stocks that are near fifty-two week highs and look at their stock chart. And that's that's a little bit deeper. You have to. But that's also, it, it, there's another meaning to it, and you have to read that book. But uh, that that would be it. That's my uh, final parting uh, wisdom and advice. And uh, as you see the poster behind me, that's my book. Uh, you can get on uh, Amazon. Just click on my link in the bio, and uh, that's pretty much it. That's great. Yeah, so so Dave will have the link to your uh, Twitter and, and link to uh, your book in the, the comments yeah. below this video. And, you know, with that, thank you very much for joining me today. It's been a great discussion and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Chris. And I'll see you out in, uh, I'll see you out on Twitter. Thank you. That's great. Appreciate it for having me. Thank you.